Summoning America. Chapter 167, Reaction. Written by D.R. Doritos, M.D. January 10, 1641. Washington, D.C. President Lee sighed as he sat back, hot chocolate in hand and monitor ready to play the next episode of Manifest Fantasy. The show had become a small but significant escape for him, a brief respite in a world that was as fantastical as the one he watched on screen. Just as he was about to hit play, his aide gently knocked on the door, stepping into the room with a respectful yet firm demeanor. Mr. President, the strategic meeting is about to begin, Stephen reminded him, holding a tablet loaded with briefings and reports. Man, I just got to the Adventurer's Guild arc. All right, let's go. He turned off the monitor and stood up from his seat. He had hoped for a few more minutes of escape, but duty called. As he made his way to the situation room, he took sips from his mug and mentally reviewed the main topics of the meeting. He entered the situation room, where his team awaited, Vice President Coleman, Secretary of Defense Hill, Secretary of State Hayden, Chairman McCarthy, and other key advisors. They all stood as he entered. As you were, Lee said, gesturing for everyone to take their seats. He glanced around the table, seeing a mix of confidence and slight concern among the crowd. Let's get started. With a nod to his aide, the screen at the end of the table lit up, displaying a map of the central world with various markers and notes overlaying it. He leaned forward, scanning the map. Each marker represented a critical point in the current conflict against the Gra Valkans, all scattered around the Articus Ocean and the regions of Mu. Let's start with an update on the Seventh Fleet. Admiral Hawthorne's recent actions have shifted the tide, but we need to understand the full picture. Secretary of Defense Hill clicked a button, and the map zoomed in on the Marishal port city of Juneral. The Seventh Fleet successfully secured the surrender of Fleet Admiral Dietrich's Fifth Conquest Fleet. Our own Fifth Fleet is currently processing the surrender with the help of local Marishal forces, while the Seventh Fleet transits to Juneral to support our EDI allies against the Gra Valkan Fourth Conquest Fleet. Vice President Coleman interjected, an expected outcome, but I reckon the Valkyries ain't gonna take this loss lightly. That maniac Marix is bound to have a few screws loose after this defeat, could mean a bad time for our buddies on the ground in Mu. Lee nodded in agreement, turning his attention to Chairman McCarthy. Brent, what's your assessment? Chairman McCarthy leaned over the map, his finger tracing the intricate web of movements across the Malmond grasslands. The Gra Valkan's latest offensive isn't just a brute force push, they're using faint, diversionary tactics, and indiscriminate strikes. The vice president is right, the Gra Valkans are getting desperate, they know we'll make landfall within weeks and they're trying to secure as many objectives as possible. Unfortunately, our assistance to the Muans is limited. Our satellite coverage still has gaps, and it'll take years to fill them due to Alizia's sheer size. We're looking at about a 30 to 60 minute delay in real time intel. The Gra Valkans don't know, but it's enough for them to reposition unseen and catch the Muans off guard. He tapped on the area around the Articus Ocean. Clearing this is our first hurdle. We have the 7th and 5th fleets, but the Gra Valkan's naval presence has intensified. They've deployed another conquest fleet, their 4th, and it's a sizable force each fleet has 400 to 500 combat vessels. Lee's brows furrowed. Though they had enough missiles to wipe the board clean, the issue was coverage. A few dozen ships across the 7th and 5th would not be enough to maintain coverage over the entire region. And their current positions? Two fleets are making significant moves, the Director of National Intelligence, Alan Fitch, stated. One is already sailing towards Otaheite, and the second just left their main base in the Consal Islands, heading for Michael. The third is engaged at Juneral, and the fourth remains at the base, but could mobilize soon. So, we're staring down the barrel of the Valkyrie's naval juggernaut, Coleman mused. With only the 7th and 5th in play, how do we plan to level this playing field, Brent? His gaze shifted to the chairman. McCarthy straightened up. The 7th Fleet's recent engagements at Cartalpas, Galavit, and Follicus have significantly depleted our long-range munitions. The Virginia-class subs are out of Tomahawks, and Desrin 15 is close to expending their last. Their other supplies are projected to be enough to take on several hundred more ships, but we're looking at a serious setback in capabilities if we don't resupply soon. Hill added, resupply is tricky. 
we've got the logistical capacity, but timing and fleet positioning are critical. The Seventh Fleet's engagement at Juneral needs to be swift to avoid depletion before resupply, and we won't be able to chase them down if they flee. Lee nodded thoughtfully. And the Fifth Fleet's status? McCarthy responded, perfect shape and at full capacity, but they're still tied up for a couple more days. We need to consider their positioning strategically to maximize their effectiveness. What about the natives? Can they bolster our efforts? McCarthy shook his head slightly. The Eddy surviving forces are primarily geared for coastal security. They're battered and their tech isn't up to par against the Gra Valkans. They've got fleets defending Otaheit and Michael, but we can only hope they're able to buy enough time for us. Lee's concern spilled out. It's looking like the 7th Fleet won't be able to get to Otaheit and Michael in time. One of the cities might fall. Is there anything we can do to delay the Gra Valkans, buy more time? Hill answered, we're already employing hit and run tactics with subs and destroyers, but we can enhance our existing strategies based on what we've learned about Gra Valkan operations and tactics. McCarthy continued where Hill left off, we recently discovered that the Gra Valkans rely heavily on manicoms for communication, especially since our jamming has limited their conventional methods. While we can't jam these magic signals directly, we can exploit their reliance on them. Hill perked up. Are you suggesting we feed false information into their manicoms network? Exactly, McCarthy affirmed. We know they're maintaining communications through this method. If we can infiltrate and introduce misleading reports about our fleet movements, we could manipulate their response. We've got their codes, and the Mauritials have the tech, so it's certainly doable. Coleman smiled. A game of shadow puppets. Make M think we're somewhere we're not, draw M out. McCarthy nodded. We can also take advantage of their data gathering methods. They typically send radar equipped scouts to survey an area. Rather than jamming them outright, which they'd expect before an attack, we can attempt to mislead them. Given the limitations of full fleet spoofing, we should consider more targeted electronic deceptions. For instance, using DRFM tech to create the illusion of key assets in multiple locations. This could draw their less advantageous positions and split their focus. We can also integrate the use of civilian and martial ships as decoys, Hill suggested. Given the Gra Valkan's rudimentary radar systems, these could effectively mimic smaller fleet movements. It's a low-tech solution, but in combination with our electronic capabilities, it could be quite effective. Lee considered the proposal. That could stretch their forces thin, especially if they believe they're countering major fleet movements. This could help ease the pressure off the Mauritian coast, maybe even by some time for Otaheit and Michael. We could also combine these tactics with selective jamming, the chief of naval operations recommended. Instead of blanket jamming, we jam specific Gra Valkan units to create the illusion of an imminent attack. It adds to the confusion and heightens their sense of urgency to respond. McCarthy agreed. It's a two-pronged approach, e misinformation through their manicoms and misdirection via radar and jamming. They're trying to stretch us thin with their numbers, but don't realize they're challenging us to our own game. Lee nodded. I like it. Effective, yet efficient. Let's develop this further and look into the logistics of implementing it. He paused for a moment, allowing the team a brief respite. He finished up his hot chocolate, which was barely warm at this point, and continued, now, let's shift gears. We've received an important update from Ambassador Snow regarding the situation in Gahara. Shirakawa was hit by a terrorist attack and during the fiasco, the beacon we were negotiating for was stolen. It was a bold move by unknown operatives, but I'm sure we can all guess the culprits. Fitch took a sip from his Starbucks cup. This incident in Shirakoa, while unfortunate, isn't entirely surprising. The Anonreals have shown they're not above using such tactics. It's a clear escalation in their efforts to acquire strategic assets. Klein chimed in. The sophistication of the heist speaks volumes. Granted, we didn't have much in the way of surveillance in Gahara, but it suggests they've got significant intelligence and operational capabilities more than we initially thought they've made a crack in our dominance in the region. We need to counter this with increased surveillance, especially independent from local sources. Lee nodded gravely. 
Ethan, I want a full review of our intel operations in the Falades and Rodinius regions. We can't let this happen again. Fitch added, we should also enhance our magic sigint and human capabilities in the region. We've got a good network in major countries like Parpaldia and Riem, not so much for smaller nations like Gahara. Deploying additional field agents, and permitting the use of more invasive technologies could provide us with deeper insights into anonreal activities. Lee didn't like the sound of that, a frown reflecting his thoughts. Catching the president's reaction, Fitch quickly added, it's a tough call, but necessary. It'll be no more invasive than what we do to every American's phone. Expanding our operations, especially using aerial surveillance, might pose some diplomatic risk, but the trade off is actionable intelligence. Alizia has minimal electronic infrastructure for us to exploit, so these methods might be our best shot at staying ahead. Haydn shared Lee's sentiment, but conceded, I shouldn't be saying this, but what they won't know won't hurt them. Lee nodded, his expression firming. Okay, let's proceed carefully but assertively. Proceed with the enhanced surveillance, but keep it discreet. We need that intel. It could be pretty significant, actually, Haydn admitted. Progress in Quila has been better than expected. Ambassador Martinez reported that King Leonis is surprisingly receptive to our proposals. We've proposed a deal involving substantial infrastructure upgrades in exchange for the beacon. Specifically, we're offering to modernize Quila's communication networks and energy grids, incorporating some of our advanced technologies. King Leonis seems particularly interested in these upgrades, viewing them as a path to elevate Quila's status regionally. Lee considered this. That's a strategic win for us and for Quila. Strengthening their infrastructure could also help our own projects and resource extraction. Looks like our efforts to build trust are paying off. They've paid off big time, Haydn concurred. He's even hinted at the Anonreal's attempts to sway him, which has been declining. Given the recent events in Shirakoa, we can't ignore the possibility of covert Anonreal interference. If they see Quila slipping from their grasp, they might resort to more direct methods to secure the beacon, he said, glancing at Fitch and Klein. Director Fitch nodded. The Shirakoa heist sets a concerning precedent. They orchestrated a bombing as a distraction while executing a precise break in. In Quila, they might attempt something similar, perhaps targeting our oil rigs or mining sites to create chaos. Exactly, Klein said. These diversions serve two purposes for the Anonreals, they weaken our infrastructure and create a smokescreen for their main objective. We should strengthen security at all critical facilities and increase our intelligence monitoring around them. Haydn suggested we should inform King Leonis about the potential for Anonreal infiltration. Transparency could reinforce our partnership. Furthermore, Ambassador Martinez could propose a joint security initiative for the Beacon so we at least have some oversight over a possible weak link. I'll dispatch operatives from the Special Activities Center to Quila. They're well equipped to handle covert surveillance and can provide an extra layer of security around sensitive areas. Lee mulled over their words. All right. Ethan, get your team to Quila and start bolstering our intelligence efforts. Gordon, work with Ambassador Martinez to tighten our diplomatic and security collaboration with King Leonis. If the Anonreals want the beacons that bad, they're gonna have to fight us for them.